welcome back everybody. This is Nicole Naditz, your host for this series of interviews with national experts in world language education who will share their experience and expertise with the high leverage teaching practices. I want to thank the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii for their stewardship of this project, which includes not only this entire series of videos, but also later two webinars and a series of short TED Ed courses, one on each of the high leverage teaching practices. The first high leverage teaching practice presented in the book is facilitating target language comprehensibility. And it asks teachers to do nothing less than use the target language as the language of instruction and to do so in ways that foster student success rather than confuse them or shatter their confidence. Our guest is an expert at this for his learners of Japanese in, in a rural Northern California town. Yo Azama, also known as Azama Sensei, is a graduate of California State University in Monterey Bay, California. He also has a multiple subject teaching credential from the New College of California and a Bachelor of Arts in Music from the Showa Academia Musique in Kanagawa, Japan. He taught Japanese from 1996 until 2018 and is currently serving as the district lead instructional coach for Salinas Union High School District. He has published widely in the field of language education and culture. In 2012, Yo was named National Language Teacher of the Year by the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. And in 2011, he was named Outstanding World Language Teacher of the Year by the International Language and Cultural Foundation. Yo has received many, many more awards that we don't even have time to include here. And so we're gonna turn it over right away and get start benefiting from Yo's expertise. Yo, in addition to facilitating students' abilities to understand the target language, this high leverage teaching practice talks about the importance of designing and facilitating ongoing opportunities for students to engage in what the authors call talk in interaction. Mm -hmm. How would you define that? Talk in interaction. Uh, to me, it's a, um, it means like learning a language through the use of the language. It's the, uh, you know, experience or conditions in which the teacher and the students make meaning together. So it's, uh, you know, olden days, a uh, teacher will uh, tell students meaning and the students memorize them. So it's quite different from that. It's um, talking interaction uh, suggests that um, it's a process of teacher and the students uh, make meaning together. So that's what uh, talking interaction means to me. And I think we're going to see that theme emerge throughout these interviews. This, this idea that the teacher and the students are actually working at this language development together. Mm -hmm. um, why is talk in interaction so critical for our learners? I think that it provides learners opportunities to conceptualize um, and the learning process is more social uh, in a sense like uh, there will be opportunities to interact with other students and uh, possibly people from uh, the target country uh, to really uh, uh, go beyond just defining meaning but it's like a conceptualize first and then really uh, construct the meanings together. So the process itself is, again, uh, quite different from uh, old style, uh, where you have to know these vocabulary and this grammar to understand this, uh, to like uh, the concept starts from uh, kind of vague, but it's kind of um, uh, intriguing. A process of uh, conceptualizing, there's a room for uh, guessing. So in, in a fancy word, I think conceptualize uh, the meaning. And uh, so it, that allows students to kind of um, use different parts of the brain. Uh, it's not definite meaning given to you, but it's really in the process you acquire the meaning. I hope I, I uh, said it right. <laughs> As opposed to as opposed to just overtly telling them, hey, these words mean these things in English. Right. An opportunity to use the language itself as the vehicle by which they come to understand 
Exactly. So, uh, so as a result, I think students may end up with uh, um, the meaning that usually doesn't exist in their first language, you know, or the concept that um, didn't doesn't exist in a first language. But by acquiring another language, I think uh, you know, acquiring a different point of view and possibly the third point of view, even like um, outside of uh, those two languages. Uh, can come from a language learning. So that's quite exciting process. Mm -hmm. um, what is one of your go-to strategies to embed this talk in interaction in your own students' learning experiences? Uh, at this stage of my career, I've been teaching uh, over 25 years now, uh, since I was five years old. Uh, believe it or not, I've been teaching forever. Um, recently, though, uh, I truly value the content-driven approach. Um, when I was a younger teacher, my go-to strategies were to make um, exp learning experiences fun. That was my focus, and I had fun, and so did my students. But my recent go-to uh, is to bring the lesson content that requires kind of um, urgency and uh, multi-dimensional, and uh, requires critical thinking. So letting the this interesting um rich culturally rich content uh lead the lesson rather than me trying to um entertain entertain students so um so choosing and selecting that type of content topic becomes really crucial um to create um sense of urgency and desire to learn and uh therefore uh for students for students to uh, perform tasks that are meaningful, uh, it's been really uh, um, important for a selection of the topic. Um, so how does that relate to the target language? Um, students will engage in the topic, um, authentic text, uh, authentic situation, uh, immerse themselves in the target language. It's really my job to facilitate um, the learning experiences where students again conceptualize the meaning and slowly practice not even practice kind of engaging the conversation using the target language slowly to deepen their uh, their understanding of of the uh, topic so um to go to place uh, recently uh is really to uh, select an intriguing topic that's relevant to our students yeah, so that it's compelling and they really have both something to talk about, but also a reason to want to develop the capacity to both understand and talk about these things. Exactly, exactly. Um, the key idea behind this high leverage teaching practice is the importance of teachers using the target language during instruction in ways that support and empower learners rather than frustrate and confuse them. So can you think about and then tell us about a pivotal moment in your own development as a teacher who, you know, especially in the latter half of your career for sure used the target language as the language of instruction, but was there a pivotal moment where you recognized both the need to make that switch and how? Okay, well, let's start with my confession. So when I started teaching, uh, uh, that was elementary school level. That's where I started teaching. And I knew that, and I wanted to uh, teach my class entirely in the target language, but, but I, I couldn't. Uh, I didn't know how to. So I would say a good 30% um, uh, instruction was in Japanese those days, and 70% in English. And uh, so, uh, but slowly though, uh, I implemented one, the first thing I implemented was uh, uh, the flag. Uh, the one side had Japanese flag and another side, the other side had English flag. So I kind of used that as a, um, as a tool. When the flags app uh, was, uh, or my students and I were supposed to speak only in Japanese. And in order for me to speak English, I have to go to the uh, front uh, wall and then flip that uh, flag to indicate that now 
we can speak English, you know, and so forth. So slowly I trained myself and trained my students. Actually, I did it for, to train my students, but I ended up training me more than anything else. So um, I did that for uh, a year or maybe less than two years. And then eventually I didn't need it. Need it. What happened was, uh, meanwhile, um, I needed that as some tool, uh, but also I realized I had to work on my lesson. That alone wasn't good enough. So I had to come up with the lesson and tasks and, and so forth. Slowly, slowly, uh, really, uh, my instruction became 70%, 60%, 70% in uh, target language, and now it's 95% to 100% of the time is in in Japanese. So uh, pivotal moment, I would say, um, I remember the first year uh, was definitely use of the flag. And second, third, fourth year, I just started focusing on the activities and tasks uh, themselves uh, to, um, to facilitate my uh, lesson in the Tiger language. Mm -hmm. I think you hit on two really important things there. One is for us as teachers to all realize that we are on a continuum and we have to recognize where we are and honor that and honor the fact that we can only move so much in any right. one given moment. Right. Um, and we need a cue sometimes. For example, with target language, we needed a cue. For me, when it was... Um, not when I did not know that we could not have candles in class, I used a candle. Um, and we used to burn down a candle for the entire <laughs> all of us stayed in front. Without burn, burning down the classroom. Without, I never burns down the classroom, but then That's I good. had to switch to a battery operated candle. Um, <laughs> but that was one, you know, that was, you know, when we needed that, I needed some kind of cue, some visual symbol that reminded me to challenge myself. Mm -hmm to stay in the language and to encourage my learners to go ahead and try even if they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And you hit on the other really important aspect too, which is the lesson design. In my early days as a teacher, if, if I wasn't able to stay in the target language, it often was actually because maybe the lesson wasn't chunked enough with enough checks for understanding so that the students and I knew that they were ready to keep going. Yes. Not just, so. Yes, it's true. And another eye-opening thing was that um, I did not teach students how to ask questions in those days. So, yes, they, in Japanese. So they they, they oftentimes broke into English. You know, do you mean? Could you help me? I mean, so I just realized that you know um, didn't have uh, phrases uh, to uh, express their questions and whatnot. So. That's and another. one of our other high leverage teaching practices is going to address that very issue. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Okay. Um, can you elaborate a bit on the importance of uh, context mm. for target language instruction? Yeah, it's like uh, context is everything. Meaning like, like, like uh, language without context is like a fish out of water. I mean, it's like dead fish, like sushi. In this case, I guess it's a, it's a good thing. I love sushi. But my point is that um, I think if we were to use this language without the context, it's really, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's, it's only language lives in the context. So as a language issue, sometimes, you know, we try to make language really easy for students to understand and then take the language out of context um, so make it actually makes it harder for students to understand that language. So it's really, uh, you know, showing the context is really the key for students to um, uh, really understand the language. And uh, I think, for instance, it can be the easy thing, like, like uh, if it's the level one class, uh, learning about how to order food, uh, you might want to think about uh, painting the, um, this picture of uh, students are in a restaurant uh, that could mean just bringing a, a, a you know menu or put some uh, pen in your ear to indicate that you're a waiter or uh, some kind of props, little props to join picture or something to really uh, uh, paint the picture of this the, this dialogue where where this is taking place. I think um, the context is really. Uh, important. 
Yeah, it helps make connections, you know, in their brains as to what these new words are and how they fit into their kind of everyday situations. Mm -hmm. um, one of your key strategies for staying in the target language is um, checks for understanding. So can you take our listeners through how you structure like a series of checks for understanding um, and what you and the learners do with the results? Well, it's a good question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, when I design my lesson, I like the word design. I'm a lesson designer. Uh, when I design a lesson, I always start with the, the end outcome. Uh, what students are able to do and to, and to know. Uh, start with that and I chunk those, uh, I identify the skills as to small skill, smaller skills um, that uh, students need to obtain in order to perform at the end, you know, at the end, this task. Then I will place them in the order, kind of chunk it, in the, you know, um, and then place them in the order uh, of, easy to difficult or simple to more complex as best I can. Again, design doesn't mean, design is perfect in my head when I'm planning, but until I, yeah, I execute it. And I know there's always, almost 100% of the time, I have to make a modification. To me, that's a formative assessment. And I'm, I'm with the students. Uh, once it was perfect in my head, but when I deliver a, a teach with the students, uh, to the students and then, get a feedback and uh, we make an adjustment. It's a normal thing, I think. Um, so uh, after chunking uh, those uh, different uh, tasks, uh, I call them formative ass assessments, and between those formative assessments is where the checks for understanding need to occur. Um, and to indicate, to, for me to know that students are ready to move on to another activity and another activity and to a formative assessment task. So, um, those are the kind of uh, steps that I, I, I'm really cognizant about when I uh, design a lesson. Do you happen to have a particular type of check for understanding that you feel is maybe really, um, maybe even underutilized? Yeah, I think uh, especially, um, you know, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, first like a decade of my teaching was like focusing on having, you know, making sure students are having fun. And in those stages, I had them do um, flashcards or pointing the correct pictures to uh, like a body gestures and whatnot. You know, those are great skills and I used it and I'm still use it. But um, now when I introduce new words or concepts, um, I often have them sort those words in different categories. For instance, like um, jobs or something, careers. Uh, if that's lessons, careers, so they're uh, they're learning different types of jobs, and I might ask them to categorize them or sort them by popular jobs among uh, among teenagers versus which jobs will make more money or which jobs, you know, different different um, criteria. And what will ha what happens? Kind of interesting is that students kind of think those jobs instead of memorizing them just you know blindly I, they they they're really thinking about those categories in one part of the brain and then uh at the same time learning about this vocabulary while they're sorting them and categorizing so sorting and categorizing uh, or uh, uh rank them in the order of importance and uh, i think i will do have several of those um, categorization um, uh, checks for understandings. Now, how the, how do I know if they got them right or not? So some uh, and uh, as you can imagine, some of those things don't have concrete, you know, answers. Uh, but if you if you go through all those things, you you walk you know walk around and you know uh, have them engage in the conversation, and then um, then at the end maybe you might want to consider. Uh, having them do more concrete um, uh, tasks uh, to know if they've obtained the uh, language or not. So, uh, yeah, those are some things that I, uh, I've been using uh, lately. 
Yeah, categorization is really important because it causes them to think deeply about the words in ways that go beyond what they're capable of expressing while they're novices. So it because it keeps them thinking about right. the words and what they mean and what context those words are used in, it actually helps them acquire and use them later. So true. Um, lastly, the authors stress the importance of several strategies that teachers should use to make the target language comprehensible. Um, for example, paraphrasing, defining by example, build on what the learners already know, use the new expressions in context, and so on. Which of these would you personally highlight um, for teachers when they're trying to stay in the target language and help their learners understand and why? Yeah. Uh, yeah um... Again, aside from uh, categorization or sorting, I uh, often use paraphrasing uh, a lot. Um, that's because, let's see, but you know, I actually prepare myself for paraphrasing before I go, you know, um, to, to in front of the class because I used to think that's oh easy I can paraphrase it, but it's really in order for me to um, paraphrase well. I just realized, you know, I realized that, you know, I had to do some preparation, uh, especially stay in the target language. You want to um, kind of uh, paraphrase um, the things you want to say uh, with the words or with the, you know, phrases that students are familiar with. So, um, so paraphrasing is definitely um, the powerful, powerful uh, skill um, that I like recommend to all language teachers. Um, what else? Um, I kind of uh, balance the use of pictures uh, and videos. Uh, and sometimes I intentionally do not use them because, I, you know, lower level, novice level, when it's, if, they're, uh, if they're working with a simpler tasks, it may, it may work, but sometimes use of overuse of picture can limit students um, uh, uh, thinking power so uh, so um, yeah so I'll mindfully uh, mix them up um, yeah so that's uh, those are the kind of things that I yeah think about Right, because I mean, I think I really like what you were saying about preparing for staying in the target language. And I think for teachers who are new at teaching entirely in the target language, what sometimes they don't realize is the degree of preparation it takes to kind of anticipate the potential areas where students aren't understanding and then decide on a couple of different strategies they're going to be ready with when they see evidence that their students need more support mm -hmm. so that they don't feel like they have to fall into English. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes where, you know, they might use pictures, but pictures can also lead astray mm -hmm. um, in addition to taking away some of that thinking and focusing on the language. Right. So right. what are some backup strategies, like you said, such as mm -hmm. paraphrasing and then yes. having that ready to go? Yes. Well, that brings our interview to a close already. So I want to thank you, Yo, for taking the time to be with us today. We Thanks. really appreciate everything you had to share with your experience and expertise that really brought this to life for our participants. And um, I know how much success this has also created for your language learners, which has been really, really powerful. Um, I hope everyone listening will tune back in when we interview Actful past president and former Actful National Language Teacher of the Year, Tony Tyson, about high leverage teaching practice number two, building a classroom discourse community. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.